Good afternoon. I'm uh, David McCord, and I appreciate your attendance today. Uh, as a reminder, this particular webinar is focused on current MMPI-2 users who may be thinking about updating to the MMPI-2RF. My own MMPI history dates back to the late 70s with the original MMPI, and then the MMPI-2 was introduced the year I began teaching assessment to graduate students. So I am personally familiar with many or most of the reasons that may be holding you back from making this uh, particular shift. Uh, in MMPI form. Uh, uh, I want to just, as a brief overview of the agenda, I'd like to start with uh, a, a brief discussion about the current paradigm shift in theoretical psychopathology in general, not just MMPI. This is a, a, an issue in our field uh, more generally. We'll then go through the development and structure of the MMPI 2 RF, briefly describing each of its scales. The majority of the time today will be focused on four different cases. Uh, where the MMPI-2 extended score report will be presented briefly, uh, followed by the MMPI-2RF score report on that same case. So we'll do four of those. I'll spend a few minutes giving a brief overview of the recommended interpretation framework and step-by-step -step approach to interpreting the MMPI-2RF, which is much more systematic and methodical than uh, the previous versions. Then discuss steps in switching uh, to the uh, uh, to RF, and then finally end with any questions you might want to text at any time during the webinar. Uh, Deborah Gwelski is collecting and organizing these questions to uh, group similar ones together, and uh, my goal is to leave uh, somewhere between 13 and 15 minutes uh, at the end of this uh, to address as many of those questions as we can during that time. Okay. So. Uh, this basic timeline is probably familiar to most of you. The MMPI was you know, formally uh, published in 1943. It had been used before that uh, in the MMPI II in 1989. That was the year I began teaching, uh, followed a couple of years after that by the adolescent form. Uh, and then somewhat quietly, at least from my standpoint, the, these RC scales began to appear. They were published in 2003, and there was a monograph uh, that described the development of these, and they were added to the MMPI-2 uh, RF extended score report. Um, th this was, I was probably a little slow uh, catching up with this. It was about uh, a year or so later that I tuned into what they were and went to some workshops, and it was a really a, a game-changing moment for me, the thinking that went behind restructuring these, you know, these iconic uh, basic scales that, that had been so central to my training. Uh, the, the full MMPI-2 RF, the whole restructured form, was then published five years later in 2008. There was a minor revision in 2011. One, scale, one validity scale got added, and that opportunity was used to update some of the um, uh, literature, you know, in the meantime. But uh, it's a minor change to, to the test. And then the adolescent form was introduced just a couple of years ago. Uh, I mentioned the MMPI-3 here as a way to help you think about going ahead with transitioning to the current theoretical model of psychopathology used by the RF. Uh, the paradigm has indeed shifted, will be an argument I'll make here. The MMPI-3 is obviously going to be based on the new paradigm. Uh, the MMPI-3 will have updated norms, of course, as the current norms are now over 30 years old. A small number of the current RF scales may get dropped, and by a small number, my guess is somewhere in the two or three range, and a small number of new scales may get added. My guess uh, would be a very small handful, but they, they will neatly fit into this the structure, that the hierarchical dimensional structure we're going to talk about today. So if you're up to speed with the RF and you're comfortable with the RF, then when the MMPI-3 is introduced, you know, some number of years from now, that transition will be fast and painless. The, the, the big change is this one, going from the two to the restructured form. So uh, let's talk briefly about this shift in how we view psychopathology. Uh, categorical versus dimensional conceptualization of how psychopathology is manifested in nature is the issue. This may remind some of you um, more, some of you more my age uh, may, re may re recall Paul Meal's ideas on this issue, and he spent a lot of time talking about taxa versus continua, his language. So the, the basic issue goes back to the 50s or earlier. Uh, Kreppelin had promoted this uh, more of a medical model, a disease-based model, where 
you had these categories of categorical disorders, and usually uh, the term disorder or syndrome was used. And he proposed a list of the major mental disorders in 1921, and this was uh, followed by a subsequent DSM and ICD conceptualization uh, based on this, that paradigm, the categorical paradigm. Uh, uh, the terminology is usually a syndrome or disorder, and this implies a collection of sometimes very diverse symptoms into the same package, which then functions as a unity, like it can be a variable in a research uh, design, for instance, or a single thing. It's got a, it's got a unitary existence, even though it's made up of many, sometimes very homo homogeneous, heterogeneous symptoms. And so those are our familiar ways of thinking about psychological dysfunction. Uh, the problems uh, with categorical models, we could spend all day talking about, and we, don't, we won't. The many serious problems with the categorical diagnostic model are extensively discussed in our journals, and few people defend this model other than the one issue of needing a method for coding, uh, for billing, and for reimbursement purposes. Um, Lilienfeld, uh, for example, questions the reality of the concept of comorbidity, suggesting that it's it's a, it's a Band-Aid, a fix that we had to just make up to help deal with the flaws in the diagnostic model. The patient doesn't really have many different disorders, but rather their set of symptoms happen to fall into many different categories. Uh, importantly, the categorical model fails to reflect the dimensionality of almost all of the psychopath psychopathology constructs we deal with. Anxiety is an obvious example. It's not something we have or don't have. It's a, it's a continuous variable. Uh, that one is actually fairly normal, normal bell curve shaped almost. It's positively skewed, but quasi-Gaussian, quasi-normal distribution. But almost uh, all of the other maladaptive characteristics are similarly dimensional rather than dichotomous. If these syndromes were real, if they were real things formed by nature instead of by vote of a work group, uh, we would expect much better prediction in terms of the course prognosis and response to treatment than we actually get. Tom Insell, the previous uh, NIMH director, noted that we as a field have made very few gains in the past 25 to early 2013 that uh, the NIMH would no longer review grant proposals that used categorical diagnoses as variables of interest. So this was, this was a significant um, moment uh, in time, I would say, in terms of a paradigm shift. It's early 2013. Uh, heterogeneity within a given category is very problematic in that it just uh, constrains convergent validity. Uh, most of the uh, disorders have a very diverse set of signs and symptoms. A total score on a single scale that's supposed to measure that disorder can mean many different things, depending on which of those uh, various components contributed most to it. So to summarize this point very briefly is the heterogeneity within the category limits potential convergent validity with the target, and the extensive co-occurrence of the same signs and symptoms across many different categories seriously undermines any chance of discriminant validity. So the new paradigm <clears throat> is a reconcept reconceptualization of how we model the distribution of psychopathology in nature. Uh, symptoms or constructs is, is the term I'll use most, most of this presentation, are best viewed as dimensional. Uh, the new paradigm then is to think about psychopathology as a hierarchical organization of dimensional constructs ranging from relatively broad to relatively narrow in scope. So that underlined sentence is really a, a pointed uh, 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 description of this new paradigm. And you, you'll see it in many ways. This is, uh, uh, these are some emerging models of personality and psychopathology. Uh, the sci fi model we actually uh, know pretty well in the MMPI world as Harkness and McNulty uh, revised this model in the early 1990s, and it was operationalized with MMPI 2 scales that were added to the printout in 1995. The DSM-5 work group on personality disorders essentially reinvented exactly the same wheel, uh, though at the last minute it was relegated to Section 3, the emerging models, rather than incorporated as a new way of thinking about and diagnosing personality disorders. Uh, in this slide, I'm just listing the five broad factors 
uh, though many models exist that include underlying narrow facets. The PID-5, for example, has 25 facets dispersed across those five domains. Leonard Sims's model, which is uh, a five-factor model, has 33 facets. The Sci-5 models tend to be very similar to each other, and they're also uh, fairly easy to relate to the five-factor model or the big five model of normal personality traits, which itself is a hierarchical, dimensional model, uh, 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 constructs ranging from broad to narrow, and it has come to uh, completely dominate the field of normal personality theory. Uh, I'll briefly mention the NIMH uh, 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 model that emerged from insults, criticisms, and the strategic plan moving forward. It's called the RDOC matrix. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that. It got so much of the NIMH funded research now, the research domain criteria. Interestingly, it's also five factors with narrow facets under each and sub-facets under those I didn't list here. Uh, these are constrained here in that they're all uh, neurobiologic and conceptualization. And to be in the RDOC matrix, a, 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 a construct had to or already have some degree of, a, 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 of establishment in neurobiology. And so that limited the, the, the range and the scope of uh, constructs that are represented here. But it's a really important framework for uh, grounding some, uh, some of our research. This is an important slide, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes on it. This is the uh, hierarchical dimensional model that the MPI uses as a, as a model of psychopathology. And it is hierarchical in the sense that there are three, three levels to it. Uh, you see the broad range at the top, middle, mid range, those RC scales across the middle, and then the, uh, the narrow uh, band. Uh, this one uh, is similar to the others in concept. It's consistent with the Sci-5 models. It incorporates the Sci-5 models, but it's, it's, it's uh, focused on a level of clinical utility that, uh, in contrast to the others, provides a tool for actual use with individual clients. I know this slide seems a little bit noisy at first, but I'm going to use it at many points in the webinar today, and it will become more familiar to you. My students call this the pyramid chart uh, and refer to it often. And Basically, everybody has it, has it on paper on their, out in front of them on their table there in each class. The three levels of broad, mid, and narrow uh, you can see. And then the five content domains for these psychopathology constructs uh, going from left to right would be the somatic cognitive domain, uh, the em emotional internalizing domain, thought dysfunction, behavioral externalizing, and interpersonal function. So we have these five domains that uh, three levels of scales. And what you see here are 40 constructs that are measured by specific scales of the MMPI 2 RF. Uh, that, at that highest level, you can connect this with many uh, um, traditional and historic conceptualizations of psychopathology, the internalizing, externalizing, broad domains. You know, we're identified by Achenbach clearly and by other sense. And then thought dysfunction is a uh, less frequently occurring, but um, high-level domain. So the MMPI-2RF, just as a brief overview, uh, it's published in 2008, as I mentioned, revised very slightly in 2011. Uh, Yosef ben Porath and Alka Taligan are the, uh, the authors. It's 338 items. These are all MMPI-2 items. This is a subset of the MMPI-2, and the norms are based on the MMPI-2 normative sample. Uh, the uh, RF now has uh, over 400 peer-reviewed publications, uh, if you look at the RC scales and the RF combined. And it's now used widely in all of the settings, uh, uh, mental health, medical, forensic, and so forth, that the MMPI-2 uh, has a history being used in. <clears throat> the, uh, I want to talk about the restructuring. Today uh, is not going to be a, a, a detailed, uh, you know, walking through of the restructuring process, but just some of the main ideas here. Uh, and one, one starting point was the recognition that the MMPI-2 item pool was a very rich, valuable source of information. The problem was in the scales, uh, which were not psychometrically optimal. So the broad strategy was to uh, restructure the clinical scales first, to address the underlying issues of overlap and heterogeneity that I've mentioned and we'll talk about some more, and then flesh out the instrument by developing other new scales as needed to provide comprehensive coverage to recover any constructs that were lost in the restructuring of the basic scale. 
Um, so uh, the, the the issue here is uh, uh, um, th there's a common factor across all clinical scales that has been long recognized from the very early days. Uh, one approach that may be familiar to many of you is Welch's factor analyses that were done in the 50s that was extracted a, a first factor, factor one, which he labeled factor A. Uh, this common factor existed to a degree, to varying degrees in all of the scales. It created significant overlap at the conceptual level. Uh, further, Hathaway, the original test developer, did not eliminate item sharing across scales. And item overlap is extensive in the MMPI-2. So these issues together result in significant cross-scale correlations which seriously limit discriminant validity. And I, I don't have time to tell a long story here, but this was the point that really got my full attention when I went to the RC Scales workshop in 2005. It's when Ben Porath pointed out the correlation between scale 7 and scale 8 in the normative sample uh, and standardization sample is 0.84, which is an extraordinarily high correlation between two scales that were supposed to be measuring quite different things, one measuring schizophrenia and the other measuring uh, uh, anxiety, dysfunctional negative emotions. So uh, it was uh, it highlighted uh, the, the problem of overlap and the difficulty with any kind of discriminant validity. And it certainly got my uh, uh, attention. Uh, Telegon and Porth identified this common factor as demoralization. Uh, and that's a really important construct, new construct, not on the original MMPI. Uh, it, this is a broad, pervasive, mood-laden dimension that's best described as unhappiness, dissatisfaction with one's life, and a general sense of hopelessness that things will get better. Uh, Welch had originally named the first factor anxiety, so he called it factor A, but it's actually much, a uh, much, bro much broader concept than that. Uh, Telegon and Benporth developed a specific scale to measure demoralization, and then they statistically removed it from each of the basic scales, restructuring each basic scale to measure a relatively homogeneous, major distinctive core construct apart from demoralization. So I'll, uh, get, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, the significant heterogeneity with regard to item content uh, within each of the, these very long, diverse original scales uh, simply mirrored the diagnostic uh, category fallacy that adding all these diverse things together into one total score could mean something specific. Most of you probably remember the history that Hathaway, when he developed this empirical uh, instrument, had expected one spike for each patient, but he never got that. There were always multiple elevations. So beginning very early, various methods were developed to try and make sense of the results, to detect the signal amidst the noise. Uh, the code types, which is, I guess, the, the focus of my own MMPI training through the years at different institutions were really popular uh, where you'd learn, you know, the 30 or 40 so, you know, most frequently occurring code types like a 2-4 and a 2-7, 2 7 2 4 7 6 8 4 9 uh, <clears throat> and we'd learn empirically associated correlates uh, for each of those code types. Um, these were popular, but when you look back on it, variation in how a given profile would be interpreted, those Variation remained substantial. Uh, there was not nearly the level of agreement between MMPI interpreters that one might expect. Um, subscale approach was popular, so like the Harrison Lingo subscales, and then a large number of good and not so good supplementary scales were other efforts to work around the psychometric limitations of the basic scales. These supplementary scales uh, have a pretty dubious history psychometrically, uh, but I want to note again the real problem here was was in the criteria themselves, the syndromes of the day. Looking back, uh, uh, you know, especially now with the RF having been out 10 years, when we look back, it seems obvious that it's not possible to accurately measure a multidimensional criterion with the use of a single scale. So when the standardization occurred in 1989, uh, a decision was made to leave the basic scales intact. This was for continuity and acceptability by the professional world which were, those were good things. The bad thing was it perpetuated these significant psychometric problems uh, that were built into those scales. Um, so as I noted above, the first step was to develop a scale to measure demoralization. Uh, this was initially a 23-item set. 
Then they combined those 23 items with items for a given target scale, like say scale one, hypochondriasis, and then factor analyzed the combined item set. The first factor was predicted to be and always was demoralization because you have front loaded that factor analysis with 23 demoralization items. But in addition to those 23, uh, factor one would also pull with it additional items on that target scale that loaded more heavily on demoralization than they did on the second factor. So factor two was the, was the focus of interest. This was conceptually, uh, it was hypothesized to be the major distinctive core of that clinical scale once demoralization was removed. So that's it's a unique contribution. But you want to pick one. You want that scale to measure one thing. And you've already accounted for demoralization, so it does not need to be that. It needs to be the next uh, you know, biggest factor in that item set. In this case, in the case of scale one, it was, for example, somatic complaints. But it's somatic complaints that that, that statistically is free of demoralization. It's just somatic complaints. So then the authors created a seed scale that was usually a small number of items, like five, four, five, six, that loaded very highly on the target factor with very high internal consistency and with co uh, content that aligned as well. So it's a little tiny pure scale. Then they correlated that with the other 567 items uh, in the item pool to form a full length scale that measured that major distinctive core construct that was identified there. Uh, the restructuring of these clinical scales resulted in the RC scales published in 2003. And then over the subsequent years, um, uh, that same process basically was applied to other various target sets of scales, like the content scales, the selected sets of the better subscales, some supplementary scales, and, uh, and then various other of the experimental scales. For each potential new scale, um, uh, the seed scale was correlated with the remaining items in the pool to develop a psychometrically sound full length scale. The decision to include the scale in the final instrument was based on evidence of both convergent and discriminant validity with linkage to current and emerging models of psychopathology. Uh, so I would say here in, uh, in the fall of 2018 that, that the paradigm has shifted. I think Insel's contribution in 2013 to not take any more grant proposals with categorical diagnoses was a game changer. Uh, the MMPI-2 basic scales are based on the old paradigm, on categorical models of psychopathology. And the MMPI-2 RF is an important, uh, a very important instantiation of the new paradigm, uh, along with the NIMH RDOT model and various five-factor models of uh, personality and psychopathology. So um, what I want to do here uh, is to briefly present the structure and scales of the, uh, of the RF, the MMPI-2 RF. Um, it is 51 scales. Nine of these are validity scales, plus C and S. Cannot say, you're used to that one. It's not technically a scale, it's a count. Uh, and so uh, it's, an, it's an indicator, that, uh, but it's not a scale itself. Uh, the uh, three uh, higher order substantive scales, when we get into the psychopathology scales, the, those three at the top of the pyramid chart, uh, and then nine RC scales form the mid-range of that pyramid chart. Then 23 kind of narrow band specific problem scales that fall into those domains. Five of these are in the somatic cognitive, nine in the internalizing domain, four in the externalizing, five in the interpersonal functioning domain. Two interest scales I'm not going to talk much about. They're the remnants of scale five. Um, so they re reflect just patterns of interest, not psychopathology. So they're not on that pyramid chart. Uh, and then the Psi 5 scales remain, they remain intact, but they are also embedded into our interpretive structure uh, in, a, in a useful way that I'll demonstrate. Um, so as we go through this, this uh, we uh, uh, will move fairly fast through this. this. In this workshop, it's really uh, intended to address current MMPI-2 users who are familiar with it. And it's not a full, uh, full length introduction to every scale of the RF. But the validity scales, there are nine. If we take cannot say and then Bren and Trend, those three make up um, measures of a, a content responsiveness. So they're looking at test validity from the standpoint of the extent to which the, the test taker was responding systematically and meaningfully to the content of the items. Cannot say means they just avoided it. And Bren and Trend are two different patterns of, of, a, of a inconsistent responding. 
and validate the protocol. So both of those, Brin and Trin, both have cutoffs where you uh, uh, would have to render the protocol invalid. Can I say it works a little differently with the RF? There's a, a good uh, empirical uh, demonstration that um, if you have 90% of the items on a given scale uh, answered, then you can interpret that scale according to the standard interpretation guidelines. So that's really the replacement of the old rules of how many omissions you can tolerate. It, this is a scale by scale consideration, and that information is made real visible to you. But you can interpret any scale for which you have 90% of the items. Um, the uh, next five are measures of tendency to overreport psychopathology. Uh, MMPI is usually very familiar with F and FP, both of which were, F's always been there, FP was added with MMPI 2, uh, and these are both conceptually the same. Uh, obviously, the scales have been revised because you're down to 338 items, um, but uh, F is the infrequent responses in general population, FP is in, uh, responses that are infrequently endorsed in psychiatric populations, and then a new scale with, the, with RF is FS is infrequent somatic responses. These are somatic complaints that are infrequently endorsed even among medical patients with, with uh, you know, formally um, documented medical conditions. FBS was an external scale that, that was uh, in the MMPI-2 printout. Um, it's a symptom validity is its new name, and it's a, a measure of a tendency to overreport or exaggerate somatic and cognitive complaints. Uh, RBS was the scale that was added in 2011, the response bias scale. It's another similar uh, one, similar to FBS. It's, it's particularly sensitive to, the, to exaggerated memory complaints. So these, the FS, FBS, RBS, these are, you know, used in more specific circumstances and forensic type evaluations primarily. Uh, and are, have break down that uh, tendency to over-report into a kind of meaningful subcategory. Uh, L and K, the uh, revised forms of those, are um, uh, interpreted similarly uh, to what you're used to. They have both been revised. I uh, can't go into it here. They were thoughtfully revised. They were re revised together in a, in a really interesting way that utilized our, the history of the MMPI in terms of self-presentation in, in a uh, superlative self-presentation and so forth. And so uh, L is the uncommon virtues, these rarely claim moral attributes. And, and K is adjustment validity. It's asserting a level of, of good psychological adjustment that's not realistic. So uh, moving past the validity scales into these 40 substantive scales, these are, uh, these are psychopathology constructs. So at the top level of our pyramid, we've got these three uh, broad domains, emotional internalizing dysfunction, thought dysfunction, behavioral externalizing dysfunction. Um, it, uh, I'm going to move on to um, <coughs> the uh, RC scales here and the first uh, first five of them. RCD, and now across that middle row, we, we uh, Telegram and Ben Porth developed a, a scale and uh, labeled demoralization. This is this general unhappiness, general distress, general dissatisfaction with life and a, hope, and a sense that it's not going to get better and a sense of helplessness about how one might make it better. This is a really important, broad, common factor, and it's important to know about our clients. Uh, I, uh, what the test authors said, that it's it's very important thing to know, but you don't need to measure it 10 times. You know, So with the RF, we're isolating it, measuring it once, and take it very seriously. It's listed first, but when we we've removed it from the other scales, and I mentioned used as an example RC1, uh, that uh, what's left after we take demor demoralization out of scale one is this just real clear focus on somatic complaints. So you interpret it in a much cleaner way without a lot of uh, empirical correlates that reach pretty far from the content of the idea of, of somatic complaints. RC2. Uh, it's a big long scale, and its de demoralization is a big, big it's a com big component, big important component of what most people mean by the term depression. I'm going to use a lowercase d with that. Um, when we uh, take the old scale two, which was measuring depression, and remove demoralization, then what's left? Well, the the factor that was most prominent that remained was anhedonia, this inability to feel pleasure, 
a lack of positive emotional response. So in Ben Porath's uh, 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 just precise terminology, you know, it gets labeled low positive emotions. It's quite uh, appropriate to use uh, anhedonia as a, as a shorthand reference to that, but it's, it's dealing with one specific aspect of depression, not the whole diverse package, the anhedonia piece. So it, uh, you can see how it's interpreted quite differently than the old scale too. Cynicism, this was a, a controversial scale from, from the beginning and middle and end. It was hysteria. The old scale three was hysteria. And so uh, what, you remove demoralization from it. Uh, it's still kind of confusing as to what it's measuring. There was a, a component of the hysteria scale that it had to do with naivete. If you reverse score that, you get a pretty clear measure of cynicism. This is non-self-referential. It's not about you. It's not paranoia. It's, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's just a misanthropic beliefs. It's expressing distrust and a low opinion of the motivations and trustworthiness of other people. So it's, a, it's an important interpersonal characteristic. And the RF pyramid chart, it really is not on that middle row. It's moved to the, <clears throat> the, the, that last domain, the interpersonal functioning domain. Uh, and then antisocial behavior. Scale four, <clears throat> surprisingly to many, <clears throat> excuse me, had a, had a good bit of demoralization in it. And um, so once you remove it, what is what remains is this straightforward uh, endorsement, antisocial behaviors, rule-breaking, irresponsible uh, uh, antisocial behavior. Uh, RC6, uh, the old paranoia scale, with demoralization removed, with no other, without a, a multi-dimensional representation, the one issue that is uh, that remained its major distinctive core is self-referential beliefs that others pose a threat. <clears throat> RC7, the old psychasthenia scale, broad measure of, of negative emotions, uh, retained uh, to some extent that same focus. Demoralization is removed. What remains is this dysfunctional negative emotions of maladaptive anxiety, anger, irritability. RC8, the old schizophrenia scale, it was, I, I'm, my memory may be faulty. I don't have it right now. I think it was 78 items, a gigantic scale that included all kinds of symptoms of all sorts. Total score on that uh, was very hard to interpret with precision. It was, as we all know, it was elevated in many, many, many different contexts. It was, it was often elevated, rarely meant schizophrenia. Uh, here, it's been trimmed down to this unusual perceptions. It's hallucinations, uh, it's poor reality contact, uh, and it is um, and it's labeled aberrant experiences. And it's a good measure of that, and it's very narrowed and focused uh, on that aspect of, um, of thought dysfunction. Um, this, uh, scale 9, hypomanic activation, a similar uh, name and similar interpretation as its predecessor, scale 9. Uh, demoralization has been removed. There was a small component of demoralization, not, not significant, but it was removed, and it leaves this um, uh, activation, hypomanic activation. So listen, I'm going to just step through these quickly. If you look, if you think of that pyramid chart, now we're back, we're going to go from left to right. And uh, at the head of this domain, there's no higher order scale, but RC1, the somatic complaint scale, was the top one in this domain. It was a middle level scale that was like the parent scale over these five. And so we go down this list, this malaise, this general sense of physical debilitation, then three specific symptom scales, gastrointestinal, head pain, and neurological. And then cognitive complaints, very important scale. It got, it's added to this somatic cognitive. It's quite transdiagnostic, I would say, and occurs in many contexts, like the uh, uh, attention deficit type issues, as well as dementia type issues, and in significant depression and thought dysfunction. So cognitive complaints can occur in, in combination with uh, uh, many different symptoms. So here you get just a straightforward kind of specific and narrow measure of cognitive complaints themselves. So uh, when we move into the internalizing, uh, uh, the big broad internalizing domain, there are actually 15 constructs within this domain. And this is just from frequency count. It's where a, a majority of the issues that a majority of our clients uh, are have elevations in this uh, this area, and so under RCD demoralization facets under demoralization include 
uh, these four of the suicide death ideation. This is a five-item scale that is remarkably effective, and there's, uh, of course, been a lot of research in the last 10 years on this. That, uh, it connects with Joyner's suicide uh, theory and work extremely well. Uh, helplessness, hopelessness, a major construct, as we know with depressive type, dysfunction, self-doubt, and inefficacy. We're starting now to deal with kind of narrow pieces, narrow constructs that are uh, uh, um, part underneath this uh, demoralization aspect. Um, this under, um, excuse me, I, I did something I didn't mean to do there. Pardon me. Just a minute. Okay, there are no, uh, under RC2, uh, uh, the anhedonia factor, there's really not an uh, SP scale here. If we move to RC7, dysfunctional uh, negative emotions, there are five facets here of um, stress and worry, anxiety, anger proneness. Behavior restricting fears would be like more agoraphobic kinds of conditions that restrict behavior to home. Multiple specific fears are those specific phobic type reactions. So those are the major distinctive cores of these uh, narrow band scales. When we move to the externalizing uh, uh, air domain, there are two RC scales, RC4 and RC9, that we mentioned earlier. Antisocial behavior, hypomanic activation are the RC scales. Under RC4, it's juvenile conduct problems. Uh, this is just behavioral difficulty, school and home, stealing, truancy, lying, and then substance abuse. And then uh, under RC9, the hypomanic activation, uh, the aggression scale is physically aggressive violent behavior. This is a critical scale. It's one of the seven that are identified as something the examiner wants to know before the client leaves the assessment session. <coughs> and and there's hi the report highlights this. And then activation is a kind of a more narrow part of that RC9. Is this uh, heightened act ex excitation and energy level. Uh, the Last domain, the fifth domain, is interpersonal uh, 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 issues, interpersonal functioning. Uh, RC3, that cynicism um, uh, RC scale, it actually now joins this domain. Family problems is the first scale listed uh, in conventional family relationships. Then RC3 cynicism would go right there in terms of the, our interpretive approach. And then the uh, uh, next, then interpersonal passivity. And then three, scales that are fairly closely related but meaningfully distinct in terms of uh, uh, our understanding of, of their nature and their prognosis and their treatment. Social avoidance, shyness is, uh, uh, has a much higher anxiety component than the others, then disaffiliativeness is just disliking people. Uh, these are the two interest scales. This is when we take scale five, restructure it. What remains are some interest patterns of aesthetic literary interests on one hand, mechanical, physical interest on the other. I'm not going to spend any time on these. These are not psychopathology measures. Um, the Psi-5 are scales that you know, and so these retain their uh, fundamental identity in terms of description. They've been revised by Harkness and McNulty, uh, worked with Ben Forth and Telekin to do the revision of these five scales uh, so that they would uh, be on the RF as well. <clears throat> their criticisms and responses. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to go through a, these fairly quickly, just in the interest of time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the uh, loss of, the, the first loudest criticism was that uh, this many years of this code type empirical database that we've developed through thousands of research articles, really, uh, is now no longer relevant. And that, that is, um, that's true, uh, that due to the substantial structural changes in the RC scales, the code types don't, they can't be used. They should not be used. They're no longer valid, uh, uh, but they're no longer needed either is the, is the issue here. It, criticism fails to recognize that, that code type approach really was just an effort to deal with the failure of the test to perform as intended. Uh, the fact that you can measure the, these syndromes with one scale with any degree of precision. So the heterogeneity of content and the excessive overlap uh, make the single scale, single syndrome aspiration just fundamentally unattainable. The code types helped a little bit in, the, in figuring out what a profile meant, but you were dealing with core psychometric flaws and trying to cope with that 
the restructuring dealt with the underlying problem. So now each scale measures a specific thing, and you don't need co-types uh, to se separate that out. Uh, another co uh, complaint, was, criticism, was that the, the construct drift is what it was called. It's the RC scales are measuring things that are different from those that were measured by the parent clinical scale. It, <clears throat> there's a similar response here. That there's a, there is some truth to that. Uh, each RC scale is much more homogeneous and much more focused than its clinical scale counterpart. That cl old clinical scale had multiple factors in it. We know that from the factor analyses. Uh, the RC scale is going to have one factor in it. Uh, and so uh, that uh, this, the, the uh, RC scales are based on this new paradigm. And one point I would make here is that whether or not you fully endorse the new hierarchical dimensional paradigm, whether or not you can completely let go of the old syndrome model, there's one really inarguable fact that you cannot adequately measure a multidimensional uh, syndrome with a single scale. So the RF reconceptualizes psychopathology as this hierarchically organized set of dimensional constructs, each of which is focused on an important, distinct, relatively homogeneous element. Um, Nathan Weed addressed this concept, construct drift criticism by noting that one person's drift may be another person's zeroing in or fleshing out. <clears throat> um, true. Excessive number of normal range profiles. This was an early criticism. It was based on a, a, a particular data set that was large, but in reanalysis, it had a disproportionately high number of job applicants and custody lit litigants who tend to produce underreported profiles anyway. So, uh, at first glance, uh, uh, RF profiles seem to be lower. The RC scale profiles seem to be lower than uh, uh, the, their original scales, but the, what, what you see by a closer look, which we will, is that it takes fewer elevations to, to communicate what's going on with the client. So instead of having six scales up, you may just have two, but those are the two where the problems are. So overall, it's not really lower elevations. It's just a more pointed and precise picture of the psychopathology. So <clears throat> let's go through some uh, cases here. Um, and um, I'm... Uh, not on my time target, so I'm going to uh, try not to get sidetracked here and move a little fast. This is Mr. B. Uh, uh, we'll come back to him for a couple of other points later. He, he's a 47-year-old married man admitted for outpatient treatment, complaints of depression and su active suicidal ideation, recent job loss. He's been hospitalized previously with depression uh, and uh, typical symptoms of depression, including suicidality. So in this instance, he was hospitalized for several days uh, stabilized on antidepressant medication, released diagnosis was recurrent major depressive disorder. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to go through quickly, I'm assuming all of you, this, this is uh, familiar, <clears throat> um, is the MMPI-2 extended score report. And so validity scales, we see, you know, we see FB, uh, but I ignoring that, we, there's no real significant issue there with the validity scales. Uh, Overall, we would not see it's over-reporting pathology. It's not under-reporting, certainly, uh, L and K are in normal range, and, uh, and it's consistent. But, and we're not going to do a full interpretation here, but you see the 2-7 uh, profile type is extremely high. There's the four there, so we could go on and on, as you do with profile types. Uh, you know, it looks like a 2-7, but also has 4, 6, 8, and 0 up, which is um, not unusual for us with somebody who's in severe distress, have, have multiple elevations. Um, I'm going to go on through the, uh, this is the non-K corrected, which uh, doesn't look much different in this case. Here are the RC scales. This is the MMPI-2 extended score report. So we do see the restructured clinical scales here. And you see what I was talking about. We only have two elevations here. And what's elevated is demoralization, quite elevated, and even higher is anhedonia. So uh, we get a much clearer picture of Mr. B. This does not suggest any psychotic process uh, going on. Uh, the scale four, RC4 is in the mid-range. So we were getting uh, signals of depression. We had that two and seven up, but uh, what the RC scales do is, is just focus on the, the major distinctive core without all the overlap. It's a much cleaner and much more precisely accurate profile. Uh, we go through the content scales, and we do see the uh, depression, uh, low self-esteem, 
and some of the others up. Again, we're not going to take the time to do all this. There's the Psi 5, and you see the introversion, low positive emotions is extremely high. Negative emotionality in this case is just a little above the line. So you see major anhedonia and some dysfunctional negative emotions. So this looks more like the picture painted by the RC scales. It does not look like the picture painted by the basic scale. Um, this is going to be the RF report of Mr. B. So you have our validity scales broken down into consistency, over-reporting, and then the uh, somatic cognitive over-reporting set of three, and then under-reporting. No, no problems at all with validity. Uh, I'm going to point, point you back here. The, the, as we go through the next four profiles, this is not normally on the report. I just stuck it in here. As we're going to go, we take the profile sheets are organized where the next profile we see is going to be that higher, that, uh, the, the broad level. It's going to be EID, THD, BXD in one, uh, in one part of the graph. And then the RC scales is the next part of that page. So that's going to be the first one we see. Then we're going to go through these narrow band sets uh, from left to right. So what we see here is our big picture of the case. This is what we'd see on the first pass. We always are going to flip through these five profiles to uh, see what we have. And so uh, we, w we can look at the higher order scales and say this is an EID case. This, this one is the most of the problems are going to primarily fall within this emotional internalizing dysfunction. Don't see any indications of thought dysfunction or behavioral externalizing dysfunction. We're, not, we're going to look at all 40 constructs. We won't miss anything, but this orienting piece uh, tells us where the uh, most likely relevant uh, pieces of the puzzle are. In the, RC, the restructured clinical scale, we, we saw this, you know, because this is what got added to uh, the extended score report, is demoralization is quite elevated as is RC2, low positive emotions, or anhedonia, and then nothing else is clinically elevated. Now we're going from left to right. We look at that on the pyramid chart, we're looking at that far left domain of somatic cognitive. RC1 was not elevated you know, in, our, in our previous graph, but in here we do see gastrointestinal and cognitive. Are up. And then for the next set are the internalizing specific problem scales. The first four are facets of demoralization, and the next five are facets of uh, RC7, dysfunctional negative emotions. And many of these up, the demoralization ones are all up. So with suicidality, we've already uh, 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 noted that, uh, okay, you see it that it's a it, raw score of two puts it up into a clinically elevated range, and it's bold-faced, so we can't miss it. Helplessness, hopelessness, self-doubt, inefficacy. Then the only facet elevated under RC7 is stress and worry. Uh, so this is zeroing in on specific symptoms Mr. B experiences. Uh, in terms of externalizing, that juvenile conduct problems approaches the line but does not go over. And these work items are all past tense items. So this is something you may double check with them about if you were interviewing, but it's not, there's no pattern there. Interpersonal passivity, social avoidance, disaffiliativeness, then both interest scales quite low. Psi 5 we've seen before, negative emotionality and low positive emotions, uh, introversion are up. This is a, a page I want to point out here. It's a, uh, it's page seven, and it's uh, um, always page seven of the MMPI 2 RF report. It's got all 51 scale scores plus cannot say. All 52 indicators are on this one page in a remarkably thoughtful uh, uh, physical arrangement. And so this is one of the three things you use when you interpret an MMPI. You have this either on your screen, on the one half of your screen, or else you print it out and have it in front of you. But it's got all of your information right there. It's you get a quick view from the graphs, but when you're uh, when you're going to sit down and interpret, you use this page seven, and you can. It's like you took your pyramid chart and rotated it 90 degrees counterclockwise, flip some things because you see EID, THD, BXD there in the middle, and then the rows that run that span from them. Uh, so we'll come back to this, but this is a, a concise and total. This is a concise but comprehensive uh, a presentation of all of your data. Uh, and the interpretation approach we're going to talk about uh, follows this layout here as you as you um, develop your narrative report. Page eight is the item level information, and it's uh, real useful. In this case, when we saw those suicide death ideation items up, we could look to page eight, see what they were, 
he had one he did have a cannot say of one it would be printed out there for this public webinar where you don't put items we're not putting actual items but it would be right there in full text suicide death ideation we have two helplessness hopelessness those items would be there on page eight printed out for you so there's seven scales that are considered critical scales that if the client scores 65 or higher then any items on those scales that uh, they endorsed in the scoreable direction get printed out here for you on page eight so it's real convenient way to look at uh, skipped items and then items from those seven scales. Um, Mrs. D, 27-year-old uh, woman, uh, referred for sexual abuse. She had had outpatient, referred for, she had a history of sexual abuse. She was referred by a friend who just said she needed therapy. She has had outpatient therapy in the past, no hospitalizations, drug abuse, prostitution are part of her past. Therapist identified family problems, authority problems, and projection of blame. She dropped out of treatment after the fourth session. So we're going to go through her MMPI-2 profile quickly. Validity scales look fine. Normal range on all the clinical scales. Um, and we see K correction doesn't do anything notable to that. What we see here on the RC scale is kind of unexpected. We get a spike right there on RC4. And so it's funny that on the traditional MMPI, scale 4 is not elevated. Uh, on this one, it is. And so why? Could that be? And uh, the, the fact is that um, in this case, that when we look back, we see um, um, she she is she is not uh, we we see that not elevated at all. Well, scale four has got a certain level of demoralization in it, and so when we are dealing with a person who's not demoralized at all, and we're only looking at an isolated piece of scale four, the antisocial behavior. Those were way up. Drug abuse and prostitution and so forth elevated those to a visible level, and those are dysfunctional. Uh, not much in the way of things here. Anxiety, family problems, approach to limits. Uh, uh, we have a uh, over-control hostility, the addiction admission scale. A disconstraint is the Psi 5 scale that's closest to elevated, although not technically. On the RF, normal validity, the same thing we've, we we see on the higher order scales, we see an elevation now on the behavioral externalizing dysfunction. And then when we flesh that with RC4, RC9, we did see that it's in RC4. It's in antisocial behavior itself. It's where it's coming from. And so when we look somatic cognitive, there's nothing technically elevated. It's got a two, couple of points close. Internalizing, same thing. Some points that are close, but nothing technically elevated. It's the juvenile conduct problems and activation uh, that are elevated here, and family problems, uh, and so and nothing on the sci fi So we do have a, a picture for her that is a much more accurate picture and uh, fits the case far more better, far better than the all normal range MMPI 2 RF. Uh, Mr. E uh, with history of uh, uh, psychotic symptoms, he's agitated, religious preoccupation, extensive history of substance abuse. The city's presenting with psychotic symptoms, history of substance abuse, and treatment programs for that, crack cocaine, uh, paranoia, and so forth. He's discharged to rehab after this evaluation. So what we see, I, I know you're probably guessing, is a, you know one of our multi-elevation MMPI twos with uh, only two scales not elevated on the basic scales. Um, you know, scale one is not, and scale zero is not. Uh, all the rest are highly elevated. So we, we have a very high psych scale 7 uh, schizophrenia. Um, paranoia is, is quite high. Psychopathic deviate depression. Uh, when we s remove the K correction, there's a slight uh, adjustment of that. The, the RC scales, we have a high level of demoralization, a high level of antisocial behavior, and then uh, anxiety associated with that. So we could go through this, and what we're seeing is we go through and looking at these uh, uh, content scales, we get a, a picture of what's going on with them that is much uh, more focused than that multi-elevation on the clinical scales. Sci-5 scales here have uh, negative emotionality is the only elevated point. RF, uh, the validity scales are, are, are essentially within interpretable range. You do have those uh, somatic cognitive that are 
uh, high but not in, not high enough to invalidate profile. Um, the, the higher order scales is the emotional internalizing and the behavioral externalizing. Both are elevated. Uh, demoralization, antisocial behavior, dysfunctional negative emotions are the RC scales, and we've seen that. Suicidality is really high. Um, malaise, gastrointestinal, cognitive. We do see a number of facets of the dysfunctional negative emotions, stress and worry and anxiety and anger proneness. Uh, <clears throat> when we break down the externalizing, we see really high score in juvenile conduct problems and substance abuse. Uh, and then also this activation component. So, uh, I, you know, I would say just based on this case, this is, a, this is a chronic substance user that's using things like crack cocaine and has been struggling with it. And so the issue is not one of psychosis and not one of eight of the ten scales we end up. RF was able to zero in on a much more precise picture of what was going on with him. Um, and then his page seven and items that would uh, uh, be uh, unscorable and then the, um, the, the critical scales that were up with suicide, death, ideation, anxiety, and substance use, all those items would be printed out in full text on your RF report. And so uh, the, the I'm going to skip over this case just in the interest of time. This is the fourth case. It doesn't make a, a, a huge new point. I can show it briefly. We've got, one again, no, one of those really noisy um, uh, MMPI2 profiles. And what we get here is a psychotic case, but it's just with, with a, uh, I'm going to flip to the RF. Um, validity scales are fine. The higher order scales show thought dysfunction is where the problems are here. And that when we look at the restructured clinical scales, you do have a level of demoralization, which is understandable, and then uh, clear elevations that, oh, on RC6 and RC8, uh, ideas of persecution and aberrant experiences. So this is a case of paranoid schizophrenia. Um, and the, RC, the RF profile shows that without all of the attendant noise and co-elevations that are essentially artifacts of the, of the overlap across the scales. This removes the overlap isolates the demoralization and leaves the remaining psychopathology in a much, in a much clearer and more precise picture. Okay, so I, what I want to do is spend, uh, uh, we've got uh, 30, 32 minutes left here. I want to spend uh, uh, about half, about 15 minutes on the interpretation strategy and then leave uh, uh, the time for questions and answers. Uh, this is, uh, uh, really a remarkable um, development, this interpretation strategy. We can, we can interpret these the same now. There's a reliability. We've established the possibility of a really tight reliability between the way I interpret it and the way you interpret it, the way Ben Porth does and the way one of my students does. Uh, we can write essentially the same report with some stylistic differences, but no real substantive differences. Um, and so you need three things to do this. One is you need a source of the interpretation guidelines, and there are three right now that exist that have identical uh, uh, text boxes that explain the standard interpretation statements for given elevation ranges on each of the scales. So one of those is the RM MMPI 2 RF Manual for Administration Scoring and Interpretation. And by participating in this webinar, you do have free uh, access to a digital version of the manual. So you can't uh, print it, you know, but you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You have access to that one free. So that's good. I would certainly advise starting with that, you know, uh, rather than buying one of the other two. And I'll, I'll go over these again. But Ben Porth's 2012 book is a, really a masterpiece of scholarship. Uh, my students buy it. Um, and it's 500 pages, and it covers a lot of material. But it includes the standard interpretation material, the standard interpretation text boxes for the 51 scales. I, uh, I published a book in, in the APA assessment series early this year uh, that is much shorter and leaner and uh, smaller, and um, uh, that has, but it has essentially identical uh, text boxes for the interpretation. So any of those three, the manual, the fourth book, or my book, all have, uh, have the same information in terms of interpreting these scales. Uh, you need the uh, page seven uh, of the of the report we've, we've seen, that one page with all 51 scores on it. And then you need this free tool. It's called the Interpretation Worksheet 
it's a um, an interactive PDF that you type into, and so that's where you're recording all of your uh, interpretations, and then you can cut and paste from that into your narrative report, uh, you know, flexibly as you see fit. But the three pieces are a set of uh, interpretation guidelines, uh, one of those three, uh, the interpretation worksheet tool, it's an interactive PDF on your computer screen, and then page seven of the report. Those are the three things. So once you have that, what you do is this. You start with the highest elevation on the higher order scales, if elevated. It, it, they need to be at 65 or higher. If they're not, you don't interpret them. But uh, you, you look for elevations of all, all of these scales. Any time a scale is 65 or higher, you're going to interpret it. Uh, and with, you start your report. You, if you orient to the case, you say, uh, if there's just one HO scale up, one higher order scale up, like Mr. B had the EID, emotional internalizing dysfunction, that's where you start. And, and that makes good sense. That's where most of his problems are, and that's what you want to start out communicating to your reader uh, is the main problems are in this area. So use, you, use it as a starting point. Uh, you would make one interpretive statement about EID in most cases, and then you look at the three RC scales that underlie it, and you take them in elevation order if they are elevated. So you go with the highest RC, assuming it's 65 or over, and then the next one and the next one, but you don't interpret one if it's less than 65. Once you pick an RC scale where you can you start with, once you interpret that RC scale with one or two sentences, you move down its, its, uh, into its facets. You complete its facets in the order that they're listed. And then you go back to the next highest RC scale that's within that domain. Uh, I'm going to give you examples of this. It'll be, a, I think it'll be a little clearer. If more than one HO scale is elevated, you use the highest one to start with, then proceed to the next one. After you finish that whole first one and all of its mid-level and lower-level scales, if you don't have any elevated higher-order scales, you look at your at your mid-row of RC scales and you determine which domain has the most elevation in it as represented by those mid-level scales, and you start with that domain and finish that domain before you move on. Um, uh, once you finish all of the HO and RC scales, you make sure that you've covered in your uh, uh, in your this systematic approach, and you will have any elevated SB scale that's there, and and you interpret it too. So uh, it could be, for instance, that um, you're not going to have an an overarching RC scale for the interpersonal function domain. After you finish all the other scales, you would look, you would scan, and you would catch if one of those interpersonal function scales was elevated, and then you interpret it too. Uh, there is uh, uh, what you'll see as we go through the interpretation text boxes. There are diagnostic considerations and treatment recommendations that are embedded in almost all of the text boxes. So uh, it's, it's a good habit to start to include. You pick and choose those. You include ones along the way. Record them on this interpretation worksheet so that when you finish, you've got really a list of potential recommendations that you you might want to uh, bring forward into your final report. So here's the interpretation worksheet. It's four pages. Uh, and this first page is the protocol validity, and you would just put in, you transpose the transfer of scores on cannot say, brand and trend, just put them there. You would take your interpretation guide and, and find out, okay, if, if brand is at this level, what do I say? And you would just type it in there. Uh, for your five measures of over-reporting psychopathology, you'd put the numbers in there. You would then look each one of these up look up its text box, look at the range of that score, and then type in text into this area here that would reflect that, and then same thing for L and, L and K. So you'd end up having the validity scales interpreted uh, written there. Now, you, and you do this in the order that you've determined from that uh, looking at these scores. So in Mr. B's case, for instance, we would do those validity scales first. We always do them, the protocol validity first. But when we got here, we wouldn't start with cognitive, somatic cognitive. We would go to EID. That was the elevated higher order score. And so in, we would start then constructing our interpretation here with a set of really clear rules that I'll, I'll uh, explain and show you with Mr. B um, and get, get that part done. I would take the time to construct these sentences in a grammatically correct and coherent manner that sounds like 
uh, my style of writing, but is following very strictly these interpretation guidelines, because this is my main paragraph about this client that I'm going to have in my report in terms of MMPI. I want to be able to cut and paste this into my final report. So I'm not just taking notes to self here. Some of the other ca times I will be, but this paragraph is going to be a final form paragraph as I do it. Then we do the same thing with thought dysfunction, behavioral dysfunction, and interpersonal functioning. We go through these in the order that our interpretive strategy dictates based on those elevations. Um, interest scales if you want to. And then these are notes to self, these diagnostic considerations, treatment considerations. This is the last page. You just kind of add these almost like as bullet points as you go through the interpretation text boxes. So let's look at Mr. B here. Um, uh, and, and this is his page seven. And so uh, we sit, we're going to start with the validity scale. So we're going to transfer. Uh, they're all on one page. So I'm going to uh, transfer them all on one page. And you see I've put the scores in there. And we know from looking at those, if we were to look up in the text boxes, none of those prompt an interpretive statement. There are no indications of non-responsiveness. There are no indications of over-reporting. There are no indications of under-reporting. So I just quickly typed that in. I am really have done with that now. I'm going to construct a, a kind of a narrative paragraph in my report that says something like, uh, Mr. B completed the MMPI-2 RF as a component of this evaluation. Uh, his responses to the validity, to protocol validity scale suggested that there were no indications of unresponsive or uh, distorted responding, and the resulting profile may be interpreted with confidence. I'd say something like that in my report. Sometimes I write that right down in here while I'm thinking about it. I'll skip a line and just type my whole paragraph while it's fresh in my mind, and I can cut and paste it then. Um, here, we, because EID was elevated, the EID of 80 uh, is, is our key point here. So we're going we're to get to somatic cognitive later. We're not going to miss anything, but we're going to start right here with the EID of 80. So we're going to look up in the uh, interpretation guideline. We're gonna, first thing we're going to do is go to whichever set we're using. And I think the, what I've chosen here is from the manual. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is the table 512 from the manual. This is your, the source that you have for free. Is the, is the test manual, the user manual. And so with a score of 80, I come down here and say this T-score of 80. So his or her responses indicate considerable emotional distress that is likely to be perceived as a crisis. So I come back here. This has been poor throughout this. His responses indicate considerable emotional distress that is likely to be perceived as a crisis. Okay? So it, you could, I would say Mr. B, uh, uh, um, uh, Mr. B reports considerable emotional distress. You can you can do can word it so it's smooth and it's coherent and it sounds like sounds like something you would write. But the content of that sentence is right here in this text box and you should put it into your report as faithfully as possible. While we get this text box up, let me show you a, a couple of things. The the interpretation statements are divided into two categories, test responses and empirical correlates. Test responses are really good ones to start with, and sometimes they're really good ones to stick with because uh, when the elevations in this range, his the, the items that he endorsed indicate considerable emotional distress. The content of the item does and that it's perceived as a crisis. These are totally solid statements to make. That if you're questioned about where you got your uh, information from, that one is solid as a rock. These are test responses based on the content of the items. Here we have empirical correlates that the, the research on the MFI, the largely external research, and it shows some correlates that are associated with that score. And so for EID, we can see this is a big, long general list, demoralization, low positive emotions, negative. And so I know that I know from looking from my orientation is that I've got a lot of uh, elevations here under demoralization and then one under RC7, dysfunctional negative emotions, a lot under anhedonia. That's my starting point here. So I am at this point not going to take anything more out of um, um, uh, that. What Ben Porath, uh, uh, let's see, uh, that's what he did too. So, um, uh, what he did um, was switch then to RC2. So you got this one statement from EID. It's based on the test responses. Like you do proceed this crisis. Then you would go to the highest elevated of these three RC scales, which is RC2 in this case. And so um, let's see if I've got it out here. Um, 
so what we see with RC2, and it, and it was a 92, so we'd be in this right here, uh, we see three test responses, lack of positive emotional experiences, uh, significant anhedonia, lack of interest. Uh, and then look at these um, empirical correlates of above 65, and we're at 92, depressed, socially introverted, disengaged, lacks energy, vegetative symptoms of depression. Now I'm going to come back to my report and see what Ben Porath did. First he says he reports a lack of positive emotional experiences. That's from RC2. Significant anhedonia, lack of interest. All of that is the statement that came from RC2. He reports. See how Ben Porath says he reports. Now his next sentence is he is very likely to be. And that means that Ben Porath has switched to correlates be pessimistic, fully introverted, disengaged, lack energy to display vegetative depression. So that sentence right there combines with separated by commas, a nicely worded clear sentence that includes all of those correlates. And so in your text, in your, in your guidelines, you've got a distinction between test responses and empirical correlates. And most of us, the way we write it, our, our narrative distinguishes that too, and it's pretty apparent to another reader. You can see all through Ben Porth, he reports being sad and unhappy. I know exactly where that came from. That came from RCD at 77, uh, and he reports, and being dissatisfied with his current life circumstances. That's almost the definition of demoralization right there. He reports a history. He, he did not add any correlates there because we've got a bunch of things below RCD that are going to be uh, useful uh, in that regard. And so um, uh, he, reports a his, he reports his history and her attempts. And then in the same sentence, he says, <clears throat> and is likely to be preoccupied with suicide or death. Uh, is at risk for suicide attempt. So what Ben Forth did with the RCD one was switch in the mid-sentence. You have some stylistic variation there, and you may choose not to use empirical correlates or, or just use them test responses. But my point is that the rules say we would start with this one, we would go to that one, we would double-check to see if this one gives, adds any new information for us, when we finish those two, we would go to that. We would work down the list in order. We can use our own chosen choice of client reports that it is likely that. Uh, sometimes I use the, for the empirical correlates, one of my opening standard openings is other clients with similar elevations exhibit these, these correlates. So I'm saying something slightly different from this client reports this symptom. Uh, we don't have elevated RC7. But while we're in this domain, we're going to scan down that domain, and we're going to see that we've got stress and worry is up. So when we look down at what Ben Forth did, we see the very last sentence is he reports an above-average level of stress and worry uh, and is likely to be, and that's going to include some correlates of that. So we have comprehensively then reported narratively this emotional internalizing uh, dysfunction. We go back to our page 7. We've done with the EID, and that what's left is ne neither THD nor BXD are elevated now. Uh, and so <clears throat> we would be fine now if we wanted to go back and, you know, complete that cognitive, uh, that somatic cognitive uh, report and then the rest of the um, uh, this narrative. And then we have uh, a report we're ready to start to uh, move into the, our final uh, narrative report, if that makes sense. Uh, so uh, that may each I'll flip through this here. And, um, the, what, what this system is doing, what it's doing for us, it's achieving reliability among examiners, is that when we all follow those rules and we're dealing with that same set of data, our reports are very consistent with each other. And, uh, uh, and that's really, we don't have too many tools in psychology apart, you know, from the Wexler, Woodcock, where we're saying pretty much the same thing about our results. And this, with MMPI2RF, we have a tool that's so, measure, the measurement is so precise that we're able to uh, develop this interpretive strategy that well represents all 40 constructs and doesn't jump to any, you know, categorical conclusions about anything, and that y your report would be extremely similar to mine. And you can see exactly where things are coming from. It's easy to defend. Pardon me for jumping around. One thing I want to point out, a couple of things before you go to question and answer. Uh, they all, built into the RF report are these comparison groups. And you can see a number of different ones from, from not like college students, college student counseling center, but then a number of different specific conditions and forensic and medical and some 
specialized personnel screening. Uh, and if you choose one, <laughs> there's no cost to doing this. I always have my students pick one. You know, pick the closest comparison group to your place because it, what it does is it just superimposes um, a, a second set of information. This is Jane Doe, who's a college student. She, she came to the counseling center. And so it can give you additional context. There's just no reason not to do it. Um, her dark line is getting plotted against general population norms. What we have superimposed behind that in those little open circles are the means of the comparison group. And those uh, bar vertical bars are plus and minus one standard deviation of the comparison group. And it gives you some context. So uh, what I can see, she comes into the counseling center with RC2 way up, real anhedonic for a college student. And so I know gen in terms of the general norms uh, that that, that T-score uh, of 94 is, a, is a, uh, 84 is a good reflection of that. I see where she is compared to the general norms. It's, it's, it's sort of helpful contextually to see that she's well above one standard deviation above the mean for college co counseling clinic women. So other, other women who are coming to the college counseling center, she's way above them on that. So it just gives you some additional perspective on your uh, data. Um, and that's a useful thing. I would always do it. The, um, that's the score report. There's an interpretive report. I want to show you one thing really quickly. I'm going to exit this and get back to it. Um, is, is this is a, a PDF of an interpretive report. So I'm going to scroll down. We're going to see um, information that we're, we're used to seeing here, a standard MFI 2 RF report and the, with the, um, page 7 right here, the information we're used to seeing there. And then we start to get into a computer-generated narrative, and I'm going to move on down to some areas we're familiar with. And so uh, uh, let's look at this uh, uh, sentence here. She's very likely to be quite pessimistic. Okay, so we know that very likely that's going to be a correlate probably, and to display vegetative symptoms of depression. Those are both likely to be correlates. But when I roll my cursor over that and hold it there. Do you see the pop-up there? And it's just telling me this is a correlate. It's because RC2 is 84 and helplessness is 69. And that's what produced that sentence. When I hold this one here, on uh, uh, it's showing me that. Now, every sentence, in basically every clause has got this end note. And here we're looking at end notes 12 and 13. And I may, I may, be, I may have to testify in court on this one. I want to see where those things came from. So we go to our end notes 12 and 13. End notes are listed after all the narrative. Um, and so 12 and 13, they're both correlates. They're both because RC2 is at 84. They've got references. It's referenced 12 and 45 for that clause. It's referenced 45 for that helplessness statement. And then 3 and 45. So, I, so I've, I've got references here. I want to check out reference 3, 12, and 45. And if I scroll down to the last section, there's my references. So three is an article by Paul RBZ, Martin Selbaum, had been fourth in 2008 in that journal, and that's an active hyperlink right there. If I'm not behind a firewall or anything, I could click and get the full text of that. Uh, if uh, there 12 was an uh, article, 2000 article uh, by Forbay and been fourth, and then 45 was. Um, the 2011 technical manual, which has thousands of correlates with, with external things. So uh, my point is that th this is uh, so empirically grounded, and you can get to it. If you're doing high-stakes evaluations or forensic kind of things, having that just at your fingertips, you can just click back to the source article uh, to get the, car uh, get the data on the correlates uh, that you're looking for. So um, how to switch? Do you need uh, – this is uh, – my point today was to convince you to do it. Yeah, there, there are webinars. The one that Dustin Wigand is doing, you know, uh, is this, you know, generally this present time, this fall, is a really good intro, basic overview of the, of the RF. Fantastic training is the MMPI workshops and symposium. The next step will be in next June of 19. It will be in Minneapolis. If you can do that, that's uh, a, a great, great experience. Uh, there's online independent study module, and uh, uh, you'll have information on how to get to that. It can get it for credit, uh, and do it do that in four sets. You take you know study the module and take a test. 
uh, you get as a part of this uh, this complimentary uh, product trial, uh, which is free, and you have digital access to that manual, which I was talking about, which is free. And the, the interpretation worksheet is always free to anybody. Uh, the manual is excellent. Uh, ben Porth's book is great. Uh, my book has the same interpretation guidelines. My students say, ask me, why do we have to buy, why, if you wrote a book, why do we have to buy Ben Porth's book? And this is the way I explain it to them, is that Ben Porth's book is to War and Peace, as my book is to the Cliffs Notes to War and Peace. Um, they have the same interpretation guidelines but different uh, additional components. So having said that, I did leave us less time than I thought, but if, you know, nine, nine minutes or so uh, for questions and answers that I'll let um, Deb chime in on. Sorry to take up all the time, Deb. Can you hear me, Dr. McCord? I, I, I can now. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we just sent a, a query out for questions uh, just a couple okay. minutes ago, so people are hopefully taking that time right now uh, to submit okay. anything. Um, okay. there, there are a couple of um, what are uh, more um, observations or comments that if you had anything to add to, we would be interested. Um, there's a participant who indicates that um, it appears that the continued reliance on the medical model and lack of incorporation of CBT approaches that appear to have continued with the MMPI 2RF, it's the continued paradigm limits the usefulness to a CBT therapist. Do you have any, any feedback on that or any like outlook or perspective on that comment? Uh, yeah, it, let, me, let me see if I can address that. I'll, I'll, I can see where some of that's coming from. Some of the recommendations would be for, for medication. There, there is a uh, in the standard interpretation text boxes. There's diagnostic considerations, and a lot of that is uh, in using old terminology. And I, I uh, ignore a lot of that myself. I, I, I don't think that way. In terms of a relevance of an MMPI 2 RF report based on this paradigm for a CBT therapist. I think it's great for that. If, if you, uh, what I put back on the screen, uh, I hope you all can see it, is this uh, pyramid chart. And I don't think in those medical diagnostic terms uh, myself. My students don't. And what I tell them is um, <laughs> don't ask when you get assigned a client, don't let your brain start thinking my job is to fi figure out what disorder this client has. All of that language is obsolete, and it will it will impair you your ability to do a good job. Instead, think I've got a 40 point tool. I've got 40 good constructs. My job is to figure out which of these are elevated in my client. What patterns do I see, and what can I recommend in terms of helping their life to be better? And so, from a CBT therapist standpoint, let's look at this emotional internalizing dysfunction domain. So, you know, we all we demoralization itself is a rich construct that is it's mood laden but with a lot of uh, cognition that results from and is causal in terms of the, that mood dimension suicide is a as we all know but this helplessness hopelessness is a appropriate direct target of cbt self-doubt is an appropriate direct target in efficacy now here's what i would say i do uh, a lot of what i'm doing is in primary medical care and so you're dealing with primary care doctors it is a medical setting okay and so this distinction here is not relevant to them because they, it doesn't make any difference. They don't know what to do with it. To a CBT therapist, the, the nuanced differences between self-doubt and, and efficacy are quite relevant, as I would make a similar case for virtually every construct within this domain here, uh, perhaps less so with the others. But, that, you know, uh, uh, again, though, when you get to uh, managing uh, aggressiveness and, and aggression, when you get to some of these interpersonal characteristics, I think that uh, yeah. Let me let me let me chime in on my own point. I think that uh, there's a paper that uh, Franz Annabelle Franz uh, F R A N Z wrote uh, with me, and I think it was twenty. I think it was 2017. 2017 publication is dealing just with these interpersonal constructs and mapping them onto other construct sets. That article itself is it, loaded with connections between these MMPI2 RF constructs and directly relevant uh, uh, targets of intervention for uh, CBT therapists. So uh, sorry to be real uh, aggressive about it, but I think this is 
incomparably better uh, than the previous versions of MMPI for that for that very uh, purpose. Thanks for your uh, comments on that. Here's a question about the <laughs> scoring. Um, if a scale is at 62 or 63, should it, be, should it be disregarded or interpreted as significant even though it's less than 65 if, in fact, it's the client's highest scale elevation? Great question. And uh, uh, I'm going to hedge a little bit. Uh, it, it's Generally speaking, uh, 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 just a uh, an official answer to that is that we ignore it. Okay, if it's the highest scale, okay, do you do you look at it and think about it? I would, uh, I would contextualize it in terms of the background information. I would say, is there um, um, some value it can add to my characterization of this case? Uh, then I might, uh, I might in my report say everything was in the normal range technically. There was a subclinical elevation on a scale measuring this characteristic, which may be of relevance here. I would hesitate to do, I would probably not do that if it were a forensic case or a case I was going to be cross examined on. This the, the the sixty five point is a is a very defensible point and when we get below that we're starting to be a little speculative. So I would be careful if it was my therapy client and I was the one using the information, I would cautiously and tentatively um uh be willing to consider it in the context of the overall case. I wouldn't hang much uh, 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 critical uh, relevance on it, though. Thank you. Um, here's one related to uh, um, the somatic scales. Glad to see the better scales for somatic issues. Can these mm -hmm. scales differentiate between a patient with generally stable, severe bipolar and the somatic issues, um, for instance, in an inpatient forensic setting? Um, I guess just want to know if the 2RF can be used with a patient with severe bipolar to help provide more information on observed somatic symptoms. That is a good question, and I uh, don't really have any any uh, uh, specific knowledge about that uh, in that regard. Uh, I find just in general is when you break uh, psychopathology into these uh, linear into these uh, uh, dimensional pieces these homogeneous dimensions, that you get a lot more useful information in trying to sort that out and make that decision. And uh, there's, not a, there's not a cross contamination. So, so uh, 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 technically speaking, their, their uh, mood instability and the activation and the issues that are going with bipolar are statistically distinct from these, these somatic cognitive measures. And so you'd, uh, you could use them to make differentiations there. You could, you could assume that they're measuring those complaints independent of the uh, other psychopathology. Okay, a uh, question here related to, I think, a comment that you made earlier, um, maybe just a clarification. So when you do a report, uh, do you not use any formal diagnosis? Uh, what have you done in place of that <laughs> in the report? Uh -huh. Uh, that, that's a good one, and I, I let me. In all honesty, let me say I'm a, a, a little bit on the on the advocate extreme on this issue. I teach graduate students, and so I try, I, I, I stretch the point so that they don't think of the try to think of a diagnosis early. I say if you have to do it, if there's some reason you have to put a code, so that they are eligible for services, so that they can get reimbursed for the cost of assessment and for services. Then you know we do that to help our clients, but those aren't real. Those are things people made up and voted on, and those votes were faulty, and the concepts are faulty. But if it helps our client, we do it. But we do it at the end. We add it on, uh, and we just pick one that we're least likely to get criticized for. But that's not part of our assessment. That's just part of translating our assessment into the bureaucracy for certain specific purposes, service eligibility and reimbursement. But it's not. Uh, they're not real. They're not based in nature. So your question when they come in is not what disorder do they have, it's what, what are their levels on each of these 40 constructs, plus other individual differences we measure. To, to your, your, your job is to assess them totally and then to place order and make sense of that assessment, uh, not to uh, uh, assign some artificial label to them. So uh, we, I try to avoid it. A lot of our reports will not have diagnoses. We don't routinely require it. Uh, if there is a purpose for it, then we do it. 
I am aware we are at time. We do have a couple yeah. more questions, if you're willing to hang on with us. I'm fine. Or? I'd like for uh, okay. uh, people have earned their credit, right? They could leave if they want to, but I'll be glad. Yeah. I'll be glad. Yes, they have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, a psychometric question here around the guidelines of T greater than 65. Um, are, are those guidelines of T greater than 65 more important than the scores with a 1 to 2 standard deviation um, greater than the mean elevation score? Did you follow that? Not exactly. I almost do. I'm 80%. Is there, um, let's see if I see it right here. Um, they are with the MMPI. Uh, with the MMPI, that 65 is a really um, – it's it, this, these are uniform T-scores. And so they are, you know, in one sense, a 65 is one and a half standard deviations above a 50, and, and that's true. Uh, uh, on the other, you know, you have, you have to look back at Telegan's uh, uh, construction of the uniform T, which took those primary measures of that mid-range of psychopathology, the RC scales, and um, – and used used mean you know percentages for each, for the uh, those t scores so that you have a uni uniform level and the research is built around that so that 65 level is highly defensible as the, as the demarcation between clinical and subclinical across all of those scales and i would uh use it it's a far more de meaningful and defensible cut point than uh standard deviations Okay, uh, reference to a, com a comparison group here. Um, any additional tips or recommendations on using, say, the bariatric reference group on evals for bariatric surgery? Uh, yeah, I think uh, if it's if it's, uh, uh, I would certainly I, I would I would pick the closest one to my client. Just as a uh, it's uh, doesn't cost me a thing. It's an additional perspective. It contextualizes it for these specialized medical things. Uh, those are 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 real useful. Uh, and the bariatric ones are really, they're, they're relatively new and uh, uh, being uh, developed by really uh, sharp researchers. And so if I were uh, doing evaluations for bariatric surgery, I would certainly use those comparison groups, and I would also um, form a relationship with Ryan Merrick, uh, M-A-R-E-K, and the people that are doing that kind of research, which will be refining those profiles. And I wouldn't be too surprised if they didn't uh, ultimately develop a uh, you know, a standardized uh, interpretive uh, report for those bariatric surgery clients like they have for the two different spine groups um, um, because of uniqueness, you know, the, in that presentation. But those are, those are uh, really, uh, uh, I don't have any great tips on using them. out there. They just give you a different comparison group superimposed on the general population, and it can just enhance your uh, uh, detailed understanding of your case. I would use them and, uh, 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 you know, begin to build an experience base with those to see to what extent that they're um, helping you make specific decisions as you go. So here's a somewhat related comment, not mm -hmm. necessarily a question, but this uh, attendee was talking about um, a bias toward uh, focus on hospitalization. So any, like as you're talking about comparison groups, would you say, um, any comparison groups that uh, remediate that focus on hospitalization, or is that a false sort of um, observation about the 2RF? Let's see. I'm going to get back to those. Let's look at them. Um, you, some of these are samples of convenience. So you know, some of the early ones were from VA hospitals and places where you could get these comparison groups pretty easy. But uh, when we look at, uh, when, we, when you go down that list, you see outpatient, um, you see uh, substance abuse, sex addiction, in the medical ones we were talking about, college counseling. We that's the one you know that's I work at a university, so we use the um, gender specific college counseling clinic ones routinely. Those are uh, a majority of our cases, and they're you know not hospitalizable. They're not that's not likely going, going to be the issue. Then forensic, prison, sex offender, and then those personnel screening ones are going to not be. Uh, um, you know, hospitalization oriented. So those are uh, those are good comparison groups, and you're in for three fourths of those. You're not really dealing with a hospitalization as a as a likely uh, direction you would go. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and then a final question before we end. Um, are you familiar with the old four, six elevations with a low five scale of split V concept as the psychotic valley? Um, this person says they don't see it referenced in newer literature. Is it no longer valid? Yeah, I would, I would go along with that last statement. It's no longer valid. I do remember it. I remember being taught it, uh, but then it, that's a function of my age. We had a conference before we went online about uh, sing along with Mitch, Mitch Miller, and I remembered that, but the other people in the, on the call did not. Mm -hmm. So it, this is the same thing. It's a, I'm identifying with a person who <laughs> submitted the question. I remember being taught it. There, there are a couple of things there. The five itself uh, was such a problematic scale, and so you know, restructuring it, where it's these two interest scales, takes it out of the picture here, obviously. It's not, uh, it's not, there is no scale five on the uh, uh, MPI 2 RF. Uh, the uh, four and six, uh, m the problem with these old two point codes, with any of them, you know, including this one, is that uh, demoralization, I, I hate to call it contamination, but the, but the ubiquitousness of demoralization across all scales, the, the uh, allowance of item overlap between scales, just caused so much noise that many of those profile types were uh, a little bit uh, illusory. And we made up stories to go with them, but they were just not precise. When you look at the hard empirical literature, they really, it was a, they were not consistently predictive. They were more like uh, oral traditions and folklore than empirical facts. So what, what I would say is uh, what you have on the RF, scale four has a real specific meaning you can bank on, as does scale six. And so when you, you get two solid measures, if they, work together in a way that is uh, uh, makes sense in your case, you know, I think I, there are many contexts in which those can occur, but you can name some cases that we know that where those occur, but they occur uh, as independently measured pieces, and I would not combine them into a, a type. Okay, and I, I did um, uh, another comment, actually, that was uh, sort of uh, within a larger comment. Do you have any, in, any um, thoughts that you'd want to share about uh, uh, cultural bias towards more educated and affluent um, ways of thought within, I, I would assume, both the 2 and the 2RF, given it's the same item pool and same normative group? All right, it's a great question. I, I wish I had something intelligent to say in response. Uh, uh, no, I, I think that um, uh, I th what we're going to see in the newer items, I know, is the MMPI 3 is in development. Uh, there, there's a trend in, uh, toward newer items being uh, ha having much less of that component, uh, that they're more straightforward and direct and uh, not nuanced and a double, you know, the double negatives drove everybody crazy. Newer, newer items tend to be shorter and direct, and that's what we're going to see uh, you know, more of in the in the three, and probably so, so there's a fair amount of cleanup with MMPI 2 that, that Dr. Butcher led, and there will be more of that in terms of the item selection uh, for the MMPI 3. Uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, I don't know what to say other than we just need to be mindful of these uh, um, contextual uh, case factors when we're assessing people and take those things into account. And we get some. Um, sense of them from the validity scales, we still need to be sensitive in interpreting the substantive scale. And with that, that ends our questions that are currently active. Certainly if um, people upon leaving the webinar today, there's an opportunity to give us additional feedback or enter a question that you maybe uh, formulated uh, after this particular discussion. But Dr. McCord, thank you very much for taking the time and sharing your expertise about uh, the MMPI 2RF. Uh, we very much appreciate that. Absolutely. And I want to thank everybody who attended this afternoon. Again, if you're interested in complimentary CEs, check your email um, reminder. Uh, appropriate documents should be attached to that. And please uh, provide us with your candid feedback on the exit survey. We really do uh, look at that information and try to make changes to our offerings based upon your feedback. Thanks so much, and uh, everybody have a great day.